Okay, we're going to take a look at some reproduction in plants. Actually, the most complicated thing in this entire unit is this idea of photoperiodism. And I have a video that I've made before that's called photoperiodism. I'm going to mention it briefly here, but I've gone into a lot of the details in that particular video. And I think I've broken it down pretty well, so please check that one out. But the idea about photoperiodism is that people say they give these names of these plants like short day plants and long day plants which basically means this a plant that le is called a short day plant tends to flower when there are short days but as i emphasized in the other video it's the length of the night rather than the day that is significant and there's this uh, protein called phytochrome that's involved in that so for example chrysanthemums which are beautiful little flowers are actually short day plants which means they're actually long night plants they need long nights or long periods of darkness in order to actually flower and the mechanism is explained in the previous video so what can we do if uh, the chrysanthemum is a short day plant and we happen to be at a part of the, the year in the season where we don't have short days and it's actually long days like during the summertime. Does that mean no more chrysanthemums? No. All you got to do is you put it in the greenhouse and you put some blinds not very sophisticated and you basically trick the plants into thinking that it's nighttime how cool is that and then you can have chrysanthemums all year round because that's what i want i need chrysanthemums around me all the time so that's how we can use some of our knowledge about some of these biological mechanisms and trick them to make the world a happier place with more chrysanthemums it's not the only example but that's the one uh, that i like a lot Okay, another thing that is important, which you all already know about, is what pollination is. And, you know, basic definition of pollination is pretty easy to understand. It's the idea that there are these birds and bees that are basically helping the plants to reproduce by transferring pollen from one plant to another. But when you actually go and you study this a little bit more and you watch some videos about pollination, it's pretty incredible when you think about it, right? These plants are trying to make babies with each other, but they don't have legs and they don't have the ability to flirt. So they don't know how to walk up to next, walk up to another plant and kind of say, hey, how's it going, flower? And then be able to pass on the pollen from one plant to another. So instead, these animals and, and, and insects are basically doing their job. So then a deep question comes up. How do they come up with this arrangement? Where is the contract that's written that said, you, Mr. B, you shall deliver my pollen for me so that I can continue uh, passing my genes on to future generations of chrysanthemums? Um, it's very interesting how this evolutionary relationship came about between all these plants and these pollinators. Uh, it's called mutualism. And mutualism is basically when two parties basically benefit from helping each other. So... The flower benefits by these pollinators delivering my pollen to the next flower, the next beautiful flower somewhere, but what does the pollinator actually get from me? Well, I give it a snack. I give it some nectar. In that case, uh, it's a strong energy source. They get some sweet, sweet nectar. They get to enjoy that. Also, the, po the pollen, if they consume the pollen, that actually contains protein. So they're getting a lot of nutrition. And they're not actually thinking, I will go and deliver this for these other plants because they are giving me a great sweet snack and a protein-filled, you know, energy crunch snack. Uh, they're not actually thinking that. We've actually tricked these pollinators to be able to do all of this. So they basically come and get my sweet snack and get my pollen and they end up going to the next plant to collect more because they're greedy. But in the act of going to the next plant or flower to get some more, they've inadvertently delivered my pollen to another plant. How clever is that? And the craziest thing is that a lot of these plants, these individual plants, actually have very specific pollinators. In other words, um, if I'm a specific type of flower, I don't allow, well, not every single insect and every single bird actually comes to me. I try to attract a specific type of organism, a specific insect or a specific bird. In this case, if you've seen some crazy long looking orchids and you're wondering how in the world are people going to get to the pollen that's at the center of these long orchids that go all the way up. And then you actually look at certain hummingbirds and you see their incredibly long beaks. Uh, 
It looks like they were designed for each other, like a puzzle that fits. Look at this really ugly diagram right here. That's basically this idea of evolutionary relationships kind of evolving together. Um, really, really eye-opening stuff. So anyways, uh, mutualism, pollination, these are important concepts for us to understand for how, uh, understanding how plants can continue to survive. So success and reproduction basically depends on these three things. We just talked about pollination birds and cute little bees. Uh, we've talked about, well we haven't talked about, but I'm mentioning right now, fertilization. So basically when the male gamete in the pollen actually meets the female gamete, there's some fertilization that needs to take place. Uh, you basically develop that into a zygote and you you make, you're making baby plants. Those baby plants need to be sent off. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can see from this little diagram, there are a couple different ways to send off seeds. You can package them in fruits and get animals to eat them, poop them out, provide the fertilizer, and then a new apple tree can start to grow. Uh, there are a lot of wind dispersed seeds as well too. Uh, what's that thing called? The dandelion. You've seen the dandelion. You blow it. Good luck. These little things fly around everywhere. You're basically sending off little seeds of the dandelion plant. It's pretty crazy. So just like pollination, when you go into seed dispersal, it's hard to not, you know, separate intent. You, it's hard to not think about this flower, this plant has the intent of sending these things off. So they've come up with clever mechanisms to disperse their seeds around, whether using animals to help move the seeds far away, or for seeds that can float in the water, or for seeds that can fly uh, using the wind. Basically, if you're a plant, you don't want your seeds to land right next to you because chances are you are a successful plant and you're already sucking up a lot of the nutrients out of the ground around you. So you want to send your baby seeds as far away as possible to maximize their chance that they'll be able to start a life on their own as well too. So all these different clever mechanisms. So success in reproduction for plant includes uh, doing pollination well, being able to allow fertilization for the fusion of the male and the female gametes, and then also to get your seeds as far away as possible through seed dispersal. So another quick diagram of that. You should be able to draw a diagram that looks like this. I think any student from grade six and onwards has seen or labeled a flower diagram. Know which parts are the female parts, know which parts are the male parts, and how that all works together. Usually you don't want to self-pollinate. It doesn't really help in terms of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction will increase the chances of mixing up the genes and therefore greater success in the future. So the pollen that's on the anther here, usually your goal is to try to get that onto another, another plant of the same species though. So a little bee will go, come over here, get a little snack, take a little bit of that pollen, get stuck on its face. How embarrassing. But when it flies to another one, it can drop off some of that pollen and hopefully some of it will rub off onto the stigma of another plant. So female part, male part. So once again, fertilization, pollination, and seed dispersal are three important things in determining the success for plants that flower. Okay, a couple diagrams to look at here. So when you make that baby plant through the fertilization and the, the fusion of the male gamete and the female gamete, you end up with a little seed baby. And this is basically the general shape of what a seed baby might look like. You've all seen seeds before. This is the place that was actually attached to the ovary. It's kind of like the equivalent of a plant belly button. This is the part that was attached, just like my belly button attached me to my mama so I could you know, get lots of things to help me grow and develop. This is basically, you all see on every little seed, there's a little scar which shows where they were previously attached. Inside, if you break open one of these things, um, you know, maybe not that exciting when you're looking at it, but inside it's a little, it's like a little lunchbox that was packed for the seed. Ideally, this seed would land, you know, and have the optimum conditions of, you know, oxygen, access to water, and good temperatures for activating enzymes. And if everything is all set, then it needs to start to grow. And it needs to be able to put out its first, you know, first roots and first stems without any photosynthesis because it doesn't have leaves yet doesn't have leaves yet so it can't do its own photosynthesis so any growth it does in the beginning has to come from whatever lunchbox was packed inside here and so that's why there are you know stored uh, 
carbohydrates that are in here in the form of starch and can be broken down into maltose and then be used as an energy source for cellular respiration to help it actually grow. So inside here, depending on the type of plant you are, if you're a monocot, then you have one cotyledon, which is like uh, the first of the leaves that would possibly grow out. And if you're a dicot, then you have two cotyledons. It's a weird word here, cotyledon. Dicot, monocot, you might have seen that. It was emphasized a lot in the previous syllabus, but in this new syllabus, you don't really have to distinguish too much between monocots and dicots. And then this embryo root, this part will turn into the shoot, this part will turn into the root, and it's going to start to grow out. Um, germination is the process of getting a seed to start to grow. And I've already mentioned these three factors. So you can do lots of experiments that can investigate how these three factors can affect uh, germination. Here's a little diagram that shows one thing that you could actually do. Uh, if you have a pyrogallal alkaline solution that can actually absorb some of the oxygen so you already can be varying the oxygen that's present there and see if that can allow seeds to germinate or not once they start to grow the germination is done and then you're looking at you know uh, photosynthesis if they already have leaves so germination you're really looking at uh, factors that affect how a seed becomes metabolically active and starts to actually grow so you can do all kinds of experiments here. The variables, you know, you're always thinking about your independent, your dependent, and your control variables. Choose one of these, choose one of these that you're going to measure, and then keep everything else constant. These are your controlled variables. So some hypotheses about factors that affect germination, uh, the availability of water to rehydrate the seed, uh, oxygen for cell respiration, temperatures for enzyme activity. Uh, that's really important. You've probably designed an enzyme experiment and temperature may have been one of the factors that you investigated as well too. To test them, you need to control all the other variables. So make sure in any kind of good experimental design, how uh, you're keeping all the other variables constant except for the one that you're interested in. This, like all other biology experiments, can be designed as a very simple experiment and you're just looking at very simple results or you can really raise the complexity to increase you know your precision and accuracy the things that you do to kind of regulate or to manipulate the oxygen concentrations or to manipulate you know the exposure to water or how steadily you can control the temperature in a closed environment that's actually a hard thing to do to set it up where you have constant temperature so you want to think about using a water bath or something so throughout a lot of these videos you should be getting an idea about different types of experiments that you could use and expand upon and they could probably end up being something for you know your internal assessment um independent investigation or for a biology extended essay as well too. So don't be scared that some of these things seem really predictable and easy. You can really try to demonstrate how well you can set up an experiment to make it reliable. All right.